Welcome to the Cherry Beckert Tax Beat, a conversation about tax that matters. Welcome to this edition of the Cherry Beckert Tax Beat podcast. Finally, the IRS has issued guidance on how the IRS will interpret and apply the so-called Section 174 rules. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Acts of 2017 changed Section 174, which is in the realm of research and development. Um, And there's some complicated interplay between the R&D credit and these rules. But beginning in 2022, taxpayers are required to capitalize research and experimentation expenses and software development costs and amortize these costs over five years for domestic costs and 15 years for offshore research. So notice 2363, which just got timely released a few days before our deadline, provides interim guidance intended to clarify the application of Section 174 until the IRS issues regulations. The IRS now some forthcoming proposed regulations will provide rules that are consistent with the guidance provided in this notice. All right, that's a mouthful and we'll break it down again. But uh, joining in today's conversation are Marty Caramon and Ron Ringwright. Uh, Marty, Marty's uh, one of our leaders and partners in our tax credits and incentives practice. And good afternoon, Marty. Where are you today? Good afternoon, Brooks. Uh, I am in our office today in Tyson's uh, Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Good deal. Also joining us is Ron Wainwright, another partner and leader in our tax credits and incentives practice. And Ron, where are you joining us from today? Uh, good afternoon, Brooks. It is uh, a warm and balmy uh, 70 plus degrees here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and hopefully we'll hit 86. So Raleigh, North Carolina today. All right. And joining me as always, partner in crime, Sarah McGregor from Greenville. So, Ms. McGregor, how's life treating you these days? Uh, this is great. I love getting guidance a week before a tax deadline. This is just just brightens up my day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All righty. So let's just I'll backtrack for a minute, and I know we'll hit some of these things again, but it can get complicated. But uh, especially when we're in tax speak, but um. You know, historically, uh, Congress has passed very favorable guidance on R&D, research and development credit rules. It's been uh, deemed to be very important incentive for our economy and our place in the world of technology advancement and uh, technology superiority. Uh, So it's been a very favorable rule on both sides of the aisle. you know, one of the great things about this credit is that for the most part, you've been able to take a credit and also deduct expenses. And I know there's a little, some little nuances on that, but in the big picture, you can deduct your expenses. Um, then came along TCJA 2017, and, you know, this was a much loaded tax reform bill. One of the uh, budgetary gimmicks used to balance the bill was to put this provision in that said, you know, starting in 2022, taxpayers were going to have to amortize their R&D cost. Uh, nobody ever thought this would still be sticking around. It's inherently unfair, to say the least. Uh, it seems totally counterintuitive and productive to what anybody is trying to get accomplished in this space. I think both sides of the aisle agree on that. Nobody can just, it's just Nobody can figure out how to make it go away. So now we are stuck in this position where we uh, see small taxpayers who think they're in a loss, you know, ending up in a taxable income situation because R&D expenses um, are all of a sudden no longer immediately deductible. So this has created some substantial hardship in our business. Now, this is beyond a tax issue. It is a business issue, and it's been front page, uh, front and center many times about the uh, hardships this this provision is ca- uh, creating. So many people wished and hope and prayed that they would come up with a repeal before this October 15th deadline. I mean, we're well aware of many taxpayers who try to uh, file extensions and pay estimates based on it being repealed, hoping this day a reckoning would not show up, but alas, it has. So anyway, let's go on, let's go on. So 
Marty, we'll start with you. Uh, start with 174 and exactly what notice 2023-63 tells us. All right, so let's just level set a little bit. So historically, Section 174 has been around since uh, the mid-1950s, right? And it's governed the tax treatment of expenditures related to research and experimentation, R&E or R&D. Again, these are expenditures that are incurred by a business that represent, we'll call it R&D in the experimental or laboratory sense. It generally includes all costs um, incident to the development or improvement of a product technique um, or design. So prior to the TCJA, again, as you mentioned, taxpayers were allowed to do one of two things, either currently deduct their R&E expenses, or they then had flexibility and an option to capitalize and amortize them anywhere from between five and, and 10 years. It was a really wonderful provision that allowed some flexibility and, and some tax planning. Um, now, new 174, as you mentioned, um, taxpayers are now required to capitalize and amortize 174 costs over either a five-year period um, for domestic co domestic costs related to domestic activities, a 15-year period for costs related to foreign activities, but then most importantly, I think as well, is that all software development is now treated as a 174 cost. So, you know, everybody's doing some form of software development, right? And so we can say that in some form, every, everybody may be uh, performing some kind of R&D activity that that would fall into 174. Um, we got some administrative guidance early in the year that did some clarification on a change in accounting method, but this is the first substantive guidance that we've gotten. And um, I guess I was happy to, to re you know, read that um, from our firm perspective, we have been pretty good when it came to interpreting how we would approach this, how we would allocate costs, what costs were included, what were not. Um, it's most important to differentiate, though, for anybody listening is who is familiar with the R&D tax credit. Those qualified research expenses are only a subset of 174. There are more expenses uh, beyond those that need to be potentially capitalized and amortized. So um, we're going to go through this in more depth, but this notice provides guidance around what kind of costs are specified research or experimental expenditures. Um, it talks a bit about as well, uh, and I find this very important um, for our taxpayers and, and clients who are contract researchers who are performing research on behalf of someone, how those um, funding um, relationships may affect 174 or may or, or maybe that's how, how that's not dealt with as well. We'll talk that a bit. We'll talk about that a bit as well later. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot in here and I, I know Ron's going to cover some of this uh, more in depth and we're going to take it piece by piece. So, Ron, that uh, that was a big coverage of the notice, but who should be paying attention to this notice? Who, who, who's going to be affected by this and should really be reading it and paying attention? Uh, well, it's a simple answer. It's really all taxpayers. So um, as Brooks commented, as well as Marty, taxpayers and tax professionals have been clamoring for guidance on the questions uh, such as, you know, how to distinguish Section 174 costs that must be amortized um, as opposed to Section 162 costs that can still be immediately deducted, especially because the changes that occurred in Section 174 took effect for taxable years beginning after December 31, 2021. It is important to note that this is a notice. It's a notice 2023-63. And so far, uh, as we know, the IRS and Treasury have released only procedural guidance. And this was, as Marty commented, really to make changes to how you go about uh, electing or really changing your accounting method around 174. That was a Rep Proc 20, 2311. And obviously the notice tells us that the IRS, even though this is at last some answers, they indicate to us that some of the rules um, are going to be contained in proposed regulations. So uh, a taxpayer may follow the notice, um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, but notice that this is um, in anticipation of the proposed regulations by the IRS. But at the bottom line, any company engaged in research and experimentation, software development, more than the Section 41 definitions or how you calculate the credit, are going to need to study and rely on this notice, specifically given the guidance that was dropped. And we'll get into when and how you can rely on this notice later in our podcast. So Ron, there are some key terms in the notice we'll probably refer to as we talk through the rest of this. And uh, the notice also goes forward and helps to sort of begin defining some of these uh, 
important terms. You want to walk us through a couple of those? Great question. Um, so there are some key terms in the notice that taxpayers as well as practitioners must pay attention to, specifically the term of specified research experimental expenditures, which cover both R&E activities, and they're guiding us to 1.174-2, um, and software development costs. So as a level set, uh, remember that SER expenditures, and this is all in section uh, number four of the notice, um, but think about your SER expenditures as defined is with respect to any taxable year beginning after December 31, 21, research experiment expenditures that are paid or incurred by the taxpayer during such taxable year. Then uh, within the Tax Cut Jobs Act, and by the way, that was 174B, but that was amended by the Tax Cuts Jobs Act to define an SER expenditure. But then 174C came into the statute underneath the Tax Cuts Jobs Act and told us basically that after December 31 of 2021, we had to treat as a research or experimentation expenditure, therefore an SER expenditure, to the extent paid all software uh, development costs. So in a conclusion, SER, what is and what is not an SER expense from a research and uh, experimentation perspective, very critical item. So uh, the IRS, again, plans to define both of those, uh, in, and, but they do largely reference to 1.174-2. Um, and so we'll stay tuned and see uh, what else the IRS gives us guidance on. All right, Marty, the, no the notice offers examples of costs that are included and excluded from SRE. Uh, give us some insights. Absolutely. Um, so... Those costs that can be 174 costs are labor costs, including compensation uh, plus fringe benefits, payroll tax, pension benefit costs as well, uh, material and supply costs. Um, it can also include certain cost recovery allowances like depreciation, amortization, depletion. Some some amount of allocated um, amount of those can be SREs. Um, patent costs as well, operation and management costs, for example, security costs, facility costs, things like that, and travel costs. Um, most importantly, though, I found when I read this is certain costs that are not SRE expenditures. Um, and I think this was the area that uh, I, I think helps our clients out quite a bit. G&A costs that indirectly support or benefit SRE activities like payroll. Um, for example, they mentioned personnel preparing salary and checks, accounting personnel, HR, potentially even some C-suite um, would not be SRE expenditures. We never knew exactly how far uh, this uh, penumbra of uh, 174 went, and I think that was a nice limit that that was put there. Additionally, interest on debt, um, cost to input content into a website, an oddly specific um, example right there, website hosting costs, um, cost to register internet domain, those are all not treated as um, SREs. Additionally, things related to efficiency services, efficiency surveys, ordinary testing and inspection costs, management studies, consumer studies um, or advertising and promotion. So the, it, it, it was good for us to see what is and is not a potential 174 cost. So Ron, let's talk about allocations. Now before this guidance, you know, a lot of time was spent on allocating or talking about allocating when you came to GNA in particular and some overhead costs and maybe some of those issues will go away, but it's allocation is still a big issue in these rules, and you can get some very different answers um, under your different assumptions of alloc you know, appropriate allocation. So, what does this what does this guidance tell us now on this issue? So, great question, Brooke. So, you know, the notice anticipates that a taxpayer is going to allocate costs between research activities, which are subject to amortization. And then, in essence, all those that fall outside of Section 174 are those that are not uh, research expenses. So while we have different types of costs, the notice did a good job in telling us how deep we must de drill down on the allocation. Um, and it also told us that costs can be allocated with different methods. Um, and then it also further told us that no type of cost can be subject to more than one allocation method. 
um, i.e. it brought in a consistency rule to it. So the real takeaway uh, from the notice about allocation of costs is, is that it's really a cause and effect relationship where you're going to really look at the reasonableness of the cost to the SRE activity. Remember, there can be different methods for different costs, but ultimately, depending on the method you're applying, there must be a consistent application when we look at allocating costs under 174 and then ultimately the add back. So not a ton of, of direct guidance, but it does leave open flexibility for uh, taxpayers to choose something that that works for them. Um, Marty, let's move on to one of the big questions that we've been waiting for some sort mm -hmm. of information about, and, and that's about funded research and how that works. What does the notice say there? Well, again, maybe a little history is important as well. I think everybody was hoping that uh, there would be some kind of guidance that would somehow allow those looking at 174 costs to treat um, them similar, similarly to the way they are treated for the research credit, which essentially says that um, as a contract researcher, um, you need to have both um, financial risk and substantial rights in, in the research. Um, what it does here instead is identify and define the terms of a contract researcher. They call it a research provider and a research recipient. So the recipient is the one paying for the research. The provider is the one performing the research. And it says that if a research provider bears financial risk under the contract terms, and I think the most common contract term would be a firm fixed price uh, term, um, then those uh, activities performed by the research provider are SRE expenditures. It then says, even if they don't have financial risk, but if they have a right to use any resulting SRE product in the trader business of the research provider or otherwise exploit uh, the results of the research, then it's still an SRE expenditure. So under the research credit, you need to have risk and rights to take a credit. For this, it's if you have financial risk or if you have some substantial rights, you then have to capitalize under 174 as a contract researcher. But Marty, can we get into double jeopardy here when you yeah. uh, when you get into an or an or type of argument? You can absolutely. You can you can see uh, instances of double capitalization, and unfortunately, that these rules do not take away that potential. We always thought that could happen, and and it seems like it still can. And and yeah, that just again, just one of the other things is it gets at me is inherently unfair here that you have two different taxpayers having to capitalize uh, the same expense where there's a long-standing policy. Only one person gets those gets credit for it in the R and D credit calculation. Anyway. I'm sure we will see comments about that exact issue uh, without a doubt. All right, so let's get to you know, the other, uh, what I call the biggie, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, but software development. And you know, uh, you know, what is software is a, you know, a broad-based question in this day and age as it is, but, and then when you add what is software development, it gets even more complicated. But all right, Ron, what, what's the latest news on the nitty gritty definition of software development? Uh, so the notice addresses, I would say, some questions about software development costs, which obviously got raised by the new version of Section 174 that I, I mentioned came in underneath the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. Interestingly enough, there's a promise of rules to come. But some of the preview in the notice are as follows. So the, the IRS and the Treasury anticipate defining software broadly enough to include everything from a code on a computer disk to cloud computing. Very, very broad. So the definition also they plan to include any incidental and ancillary rights that are in essence necessary to affect the acquisition of the title to the ownership of, or the right to use the software, and that are used only in connection with that specific computer software. Again, this is according to the notice. I would expect when you think about potentially the double jeopardy, when you begin to think about uh, some of the guidance in this notice, and remember it is a notice, that they are going to receive a lot of feedback. So, for example, when we talk about taxing software, um, it does say Section 174 computer software 
will not include databases in many circumstances. The definition will include only upgrades and enhancements to databases that either add a function or materially improved efficiency or a speed of the software. But then the notice goes on to tell us that software development activities will not include, excuse me, will include planning stages such as identification of a program requirement. Um, software development won't include tasks that involve adopting software to a purchaser's business or vice versa. So when you think about you know, software development costs, the notice attempted to give us, I'll say, broad definitions around activities that are software development and activities that are not software development in Section 5. And so that is a very important read to taxpayers as well as practitioners uh, because that's an area that candidly caused, in my mind's eye, more questions than it did give us guidance. So, Marty, there are a lot of other transactions covered in this notice or issues like uh, dispositions or um, uh, short tax years and uh, when the midpoint of a year happens and things of that sort for, for this. But let's be clear about, you know, we, we talked about this coming at the last minute before a deadline, but but it's not necessarily going to stop taxpayers from filing their returns now or having to go back and do a bunch of, of, of work because this notice really isn't technically effective yet. It's not technically effective yet, although taxpayers can rely on it for the tax year beginning after uh, January 31st, 2021. And if we do see regulations, then they'll be effective back to, I guess, 9-8, 2023, uh, probably 2 p.m. on a Friday, <laughs> so. All right, Ron, in the last section of the notice, the IRS requests comments on the guidance offered, which I'm sure they will get plenty, and what should be in the regulations. What are your thoughts on where the IRS should make some changes, add clarity, or cover topics missed? Taxpayer can can rely on, on the notice. But in section 11, there are very specific requests for comments in the notice. Um, and this just tells you that the Treasury Department and the IRS still have a lot of questions around how to provide future and more procedural guidance um, in regards to 174. So some of the areas that they ask for is help us with what should be the scope of 174. So when you think about should additional guidance, uh, is it needed regarding identifying expenditures allocable to SCR activities and allocating such expenditures to SCR activities? Should there be simplified methods or safe harbors, if you will, to provide taxpayers for identifying expenditures which are, again, allocable to an SRE activity? And how do you go about allocating such expenditures to those SER activities? We touched on software development or section four and five of the notice. So they ask for very specific comments in regards to the definition of computer software beyond the broad guidance. So one of their questions is, is it more appropriate is it a more appropriate definition under FASB or an appropriate industry standard instead of how they've defined the broad guidance? Um, they also talked about research under or performed under a contract. This is section six of the notice. And so they, they ask us whether rules for determining whether a party to a research contract has SARE expenditures under 174 um, and, and give us help there. Um, should there be special rules needed for service or manufacturing production contracts, uh, including 460 long-term contracts? And then uh, kind of a broad uh, ask, but it proves my point, is there are other factors that should be considered in determining whether a party to a research contract even has SERE expenditures? They talk a lot about disposition and retirement or abandonment of property in Section 7. And of course, they ask us, well, you know, what, if any, changes to these rules are appropriate um, in regards to what they could potentially be abuses? And then, as I already mentioned, Section 8 talks about the long-term contracts under 460. And so you're getting the feel that the IRS put out guidance very, very late with a lot of questions, a lot of uh, feedback is needed. So that's why I think you also saw that a taxpayer can rely on this notice um, if they so choose. But ultimately, 
when you think about a taxable year ending after September 8th, i.e. the date of the notice, that's really where this, quote, guidance can, comes to play. So I think what we'll see um, is a lot more procedural or guidance prior to the proposed regulations. All righty, let's move on to final comments. Uh, Mr. Caraman, the floor is yours first. Yeah, I would say as a practitioner who's been talking to clients for the last few years about whether this provision and change to 174 will be repealed, continue, all the uncertainty around that. And um, I guess I would just say I'm happy to see the IRS is taking it seriously to provide guidance. I think it makes the conversations easier with clients to say this isn't going away right now. Here's some guidance from the service. I actually found the guidance to be fairly reasonable and not necessarily different from the way that we've been approaching these uh, throughout the year. So I was I was actually happy to find it verified a bit of my thoughts about how we were approaching these. OK, Ron, and, and if you could, Ron, um, you know, could you, can you uh, exercise a little prognosticity? prognostication about uh, will this be repealed in another year or, or how long is this going to, you know, how long will the shelf life be on this thing? So where we sit today, which is good and bad, is that we do have on the House side a bill that would call for repeal uh, effective to January 1 of 22. It has been passed out of the House Ways and Means Committee. Expectation is when it goes to the floor for a vote in the House that it, it will pass. I think a general thought process is that it could be a piece of legislation contained in the tax extender legislation, which we will not see until the, the December timetable. I would go on and make the comment that the IRS, uh, to my, my last question, was asking taxpayers and professionals to really provide comments concerning this guidance by November 23rd of 2024. Um, so they've kind of pushed it out um, from the September 8th in, in my assessment. But bottom line is, is that's the date when they want to, to evaluate comments. Uh, but what I would say is, is that the interim guidance or the uh, clamoring of taxpayers and practitioners to give some guidance was welcome. I, I would concur with Marty is that we as a firm really kind of had figured out the provisions or at least on broad guidance and had applied that uh, to our taxpayers and clients for the 22 year. And you, sir. Uh, yeah, I think Ron hit on uh, a point there that it is important uh, for taxpayers who are interested in the regulations and how this law is applied to reach out to their industry groups their, um, that, are, that have input to get comments back to Treasury about the regulations and what they'd like to see. Uh, don't just sit back, but, but take an active role in uh, helping to make this law better, uh, particularly in the funded research area and the software development area. I think those are, are areas that touch on so many taxpayers and uh, would make a difference to get some input, um, like the situation where you might have a uh, service research provider and uh, the research recipient both having to capitalize costs. That seems like an area that um, ought to be able to, to get some better guidance on. Okay, and for my part, I'll just say, I'm still not sure the world has grasped these rules and the impact of these rules. And again, it's easy if you're in the uh, white lab coat environment to think, oh, these rules are going to apply to me. And maybe if you've been taking substantial R&D credits with your manufacturing business, it's easy to see where it applies. But uh, you know, the scary thing of these rules to me continue to be how broad their reach could be into so many businesses who do not take R&D credits. So. Um, and I, again, just hope IRS, I mean, Congress gets rid of this. I think 2022 seems like a lost cause at this point. It'd be nice if we could get 2023. Who knows? All right. Let's wrap on this discussion of notice 2023-63, uh, dealing with the Section 174 capitalization and amortization rules. Thank you for listening in. A quick disclaimer that we are not providing tax advice on this podcast. 
Please consult with your tax advisor, hopefully at Cherry Beckert, with your specific tax issues or to discuss the information from today's podcast. Check out the firm's website at cbh.com for the latest guidance and materials on this and other tax and business topics. This concludes today's podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, our listeners, for spending your time with us. We truly appreciate it. Let's call it a day and go forth in peace. <music>